can go ahead and start. We have a poll for all of you this evening to start us out. And we just want to know if you've ever participated in a citizen science project before, and if you've ever participated in a smelt survey before. Just get a sense of where we're at, and then we'll show you the results in a minute. So far, it looks like many of you have done citizen science work, but not necessarily smelt surveys. So you are in for a treat this evening, learning about how to do smelt surveys. It looks like a good portion of you have already voted. So if you're just entering, please keep yourself on mute and go ahead and answer the poll questions as we get started here in our smelt spawning citizen science training. Again, we're asking that questions during the presentation are gonna be put in the chat so that myself and others um, involved in this project can sort of go through your questions as we go. And we'll make sure to try and get all of the questions answered as we go through the presentation. And just an FYI that we are recording it, this training this evening. Um, we do have the option for folks to um, watch the recorded version of this training uh, in order to gear up for smelt surveying. So um, that's another good reason to keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. <laughs> um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, Jeremy, if you want to close out the poll. And... Are folks seeing the results from that? Looks like uh, about half of you, a little more than half, have done citizen science work before. And a lot of people have never participated in a smelt survey. So get your notebooks out, pay extra close attention. Um, we're super appreciative of your time this evening and um, also your flexibility in doing this training virtually. Um, we would have appreciated the chance to meet you all in person um, and do an in-person training, but we've had to do some workarounds from the pandemic, um, but it's also provided some really great opportunity for um, people like you who are interested in the work that we do to conserve and protect and manage smelt around the state. Um, and so without further ado, we'll get into the training. Um, first, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Molly Payne Wynn. I'm the Freshwater Program Director with the Nature Conservancy in Maine. And here tonight with my um, colleague, Jeremy Clucci, who's going to be on the, the operating board for our Zoom webinar tonight, um, Sarah Madrinal with the Downey Salmon Federation, who is really a leader in this work and has done this for a number of years. Um, Danielle Frechette with the Department of Marine Resources, and Riley Young-Morse from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. So you'll hear from um, each of us this evening, and uh, if you want to take it away, Danielle. Thank you, Molly. The poll is still up on my screen. Okay. Yeah, I think you have to exit out of the poll on your own, everyone. So if it's still a window that's blocking the screen, um, make sure you do that. And one final reminder to put questions in the chat. All right, let's get started. Rainbow smelts are one of the 12 species of diagemus or sea run fish here in Maine. These are fish that spend part of their life cycle in the marine environment and part of their life cycle in freshwater. Because these fish require access to healthy and functioning marine and freshwater habitat, they're a great indicator of how our, our ecosystems are doing, particularly species like rainbow smelt that require cold water and are therefore really good indicators of a changing climate. 
Rainbow smelt are just about our smallest species of sea run fish here in Maine. They're on the order of about 10 inches long. They're a beautiful silvery fish and they're recognizable by their slender body, pointed head and very forked tail. The spawning season here in Maine runs from March to May and it depends on stream temperature. So the timing of spawning is going to be different depending on what part of the coastline you're surveying along. These fish spawn either at or above the head of tide in brackish or fresh water. And the spawning run can last from 10 days to about three weeks. The spring spawning smelt survey has quite a long history. It started in the early 1970s with efforts by the Department of Marine Resources. There were surveys in the 80s by Fish and Wildlife, surveys earlier in the 2000s by DMR and Marine Patrol. And then in 2014, a citizen science effort was launched uh, with spearheaded by Downey Salmon Federation and in collaboration with DMR. In 2020, we launched an expanded citizen science survey that's a collaboration between DSF, DMR, TNC, and GMRI. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So our current smelt survey has three key goals. We have a science goal, which is to conduct a long-term scientifically rigorous survey coastwide to identify where smelts are spawning here in Maine. Our participant goal is to connect people to the sea run smelts in our tidal streams, the science of monitoring them, and also to each other as essential partners in serving as stewards of our, our tidal river habitat. Our participation goal is to engage individuals of all ages, backgrounds, and levels of education to contribute smelt spawning survey data annually from the New Hampshire border all the way up to the Canadian border. Citizen science is so important to this effort because we have a huge number of streams here in Maine. There are 297 surveyed smelt streams and they're spread along a huge tidal coastline almost 3,478 3, miles exactly. Um, and so with the help of, of all of you, of citizen scientists, we can survey more streams in a given year. We really need more boots on the ground to be able to cover as many of these streams every year as possible. The data that you collect will be used to help us identify undocumented smelt runs. It will help us prioritize streams where we want to do population restoration. And it will help us identify streams where culvert replacements or road stream crossing improvements could help us improve not only the habitat for spawning for, for smelt, but for our other sea run fish as well. I love this photograph. Um, it was taken in Perry, Maine after a uh, road stream crossing was repaired. And what you're seeing there is just an absolutely enormous smelt egg bed. So this is a, a really good example of how these surveys can help us improve the habitat for the species. So with that, I'd like to transition over to Sarah Maginal, who's going to start giving us a few details about the survey itself. All right, so um, now we're gonna get into some of the more nitty gritty about the survey itself. Um, and I'm going to talk about some required materials, some safety protocols, and then we're going to jump into the data sheets. I will say before I start, you don't need to write every word we're saying down. We have wonderful resources online. Um, we will be following up with everybody um, who wants to participate in the survey via email afterwards. So um, certainly take notes as you wish, but um, don't feel the need to write every single word down. So the required materials for the survey are pretty simple. Um, we ask that you print your data sheets, um, which I'm gonna show in a few minutes, um, so that you can take notes in the field and, and write down your observations. Um, there's also a requirement to take a photograph of the stream that you're surveying. So your cell phone camera is perfectly adequate. Um, any other cameras that you wanna use are fine as long as you can upload um, the photo online. Um, a flashlight or a headlamp is required for the adult smelt survey. So there's actually two pieces of the survey. There's an um, adult survey 
for smelt at night. And then there's a survey for smelt eggs during the day. So obviously at night, you're gonna need some kind of light. Um, and then finally, after you've surveyed in the field, you're gonna need a computer or your smartphone to log in your data from your data sheet. Um, so anything that has a connection to the internet is perfectly adequate um, for that. So then I just wanna go um, a little bit into the safety guidelines. Um, for most of these safety guidelines, it's common sense. Um, if you've been out fishing before, if you've been out near the water, you probably have a pretty good idea of um, how to operate safely um, in slippery stream um, environments. So we do ask that if possible, um, you always work with a partner um, so that way, if, um, you know, anything were to happen, um, you could have somebody there. And it also really helps um, if you're able to have a partner, whether it's somebody you live with um, or um, somebody that, you know, you're in your COVID bubble with. Um, we also ask that you follow COVID protocols um, as well. Um, but to work with a partner um, is best practice. Um, we can also certainly, um, if there are folks who are working in the same area and um, who are interested in, in partnering up in a safe social distance way, we can certainly help with that. Um, so we also really don't want folks um, scaling down cliffs and um, going down really slippery paths down to the water. So um, if you see the best smelt river, the best smelt stream in the world, but you can't get down to it safely, please don't go. Um, it's not worth um, your time and uh, potentially your injury. Um, one thing um, to just to note is to stay low as you are um, walking um, along the stream. Um, you are not allowed to walk in the stream, especially if there are adult smelt there, it's actually illegal. Um, but a general rule is do not step in the stream. So when you're being near the stream, um, just make sure to, to stay low. Um, of course, you know, this survey is going to be um, starting, depending on where you live, of course, as Danielle said, it's starting in the spring. So there's going to be there's going to be bugs, so be prepared for that. And of course, no matter where you are on the coast, we have poison ivy. Um, I run into it all the time when I'm surveying. So um, make sure that you know what poison ivy looks like um, and that you stay away from it, especially at night. It's, it's really easy to um, walk into it on the side of the stream. And then some just some additional um, guidelines. Again, follow current COVID guidelines. Um, you can find those on the main CDC. Um, and overall, just be respectful of other uses of the stream. We are um, very lucky and fortunate that we're gonna be get to, getting to go down into the stream and look at fish, but there are other uses for the stream, such as recreation, fishing, birding. Um, so especially if you're going down to the stream at night, um, make sure that you're not only respectful of the other people that may be using the stream, but you're respectful of landowners that may be nearby. Um, so, you know, just uh, keep quiet as, as much as you can um, and certainly enjoy, enjoy everything while you're out there. And again, um, we ask that you don't step in the stream. Um, for per smelt fishing regulations, it's illegal, like I mentioned, but also if you see anything else that seems amiss in the stream, near the stream, um, we ask that you do not disrupt the environment in any way. Um, if you do see something like fish in distress or a bird in distress, um, we ask that you note that. Um, and if certainly if it's a fish, you can get in touch with um, myself or Danielle. Um, and if it's a, a bird or something like that, you can, you can get in touch with um, the appropriate folks um, to make sure, but you know, don't, don't move anything in the stream, don't move debris, and um, certainly uh, don't interact with any animals. So now I'm gonna go into um, the data sheet and um, we're just gonna look through the data sheet. Again, you don't have to um, <laughs> write everything down. And this is the data sheet. Before I pull it up, I wanna note, this is the data sheet we have without protocols. So we have an additional data sheet. Again, this is all up on the website. 
um, that has protocols so you can be reminded of what each question is really asking you um, as you're actually out in the field and writing it down. So if, if you're very comfortable with smelt, if you're very comfortable doing surveys, maybe you're um, a biologist yourself, um, you probably can go with the data sheet without protocols, which I'm showing you all now. Um, but if you're not as sure, use the one with protocols. Um, it has all the same um, data information that you that you fill in. So great. So this is the data sheet. Um, I'm going to go over the first bit um, and or actually Danielle is going to go over the first bit and then we're going to switch. Um, and Danielle and I also, I want to say, are going to go over everything more in detail. So this is just our overview. And, um, you know, we just ask that it, at this time, you just hold your questions a little bit. Um, and then when we go into everything in more detail, um, that'll be a, a great time to ask further questions. All right. So when we get to a site, the first thing that we need to do is record when and where we are there. So you'll see on your data sheet, you'll see questions that are marked with a red asterisk. Those are required fields. Please fill out as much as your data of your data sheet as possible, but absolutely make sure that you have those red asterisk fields filled in. So we need the month, day, and year. And then we need your coordinates, so your latitude and longitude, so we know exactly where you're serving, because I don't know about you, but I've noticed there's an awful lot of mill streams in Maine. And so we wanna make sure that we know that you're serving in mill stream in, oh, down East Maine and not mill stream in York County, for example. Um, so you can find your latitude and longitude using a GPS or using the, uh, find function on your phone. Um, I won't go into how to do that on your cell phone because uh, the different oper cell phone operating systems are different, but we do have instructions for that on the website. The next thing we need to know is what time you're surveying. So we'd like the hour and minute that you're conducting your survey and the site access. Were you on public or private land? We also want to know what the weather's like. Is it clear, cloudy, sunny? Is there some form of precipitation? Uh, or is it pea soup fog? And then we'd also like to know the tide phase, so low, middle, or high. And you can do that by checking the tide table closest to you. Again, we won't go into that here. If you need help checking the tide tables, we do have information on that on the website as well. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, there are two um, parts to the survey. Um, you are welcome to um, look for smelt eggs or look for adult smelt only or look for both. Um, so the smelt eggs you're going to be looking for during the day. So we're looking for the approximate width and length of the egg bed that question is not required. Um, so if you're not confident on one of the questions um, that isn't required, um, you certainly are welcome to reach out to Danielle or I, but we um, would suggest that if you're uncomfortable answering one of the questions that's not required, um, that you don't fill it out um, instead of filling it out incorrectly. And again, Danielle and I are happy to, to help folks um, really understand everything. The number of eggs uh, is a required question. We will go over in a little bit how to understand um, how many eggs there might be uh, in a stream bed. Um, and uh, one of the answers you can put for the number of eggs is we did not survey during the day. So those are gonna be folks who are just looking for adult smell at night. That is the answer that you would circle. And I just wanted to make sure that that was very clear. Um, are the eggs alive? Um, this is not a required question. Um, we're gonna go over this um, in a little bit with some photos. Um, so it's mostly alive, mostly dead, all dead or all alive. Um, are there algae on the eggs? That's just, you know, pretty much a, a green film that's on the eggs. Um, are any of the eggs being eaten? Um, that's an exciting question. Um, maybe you'll see a predator, maybe um, 
you'll see a fish eating the eggs. Maybe you'll see a mammal, a bird eating the eggs. Um, I personally um, have not seen eggs um, being eaten. So if you saw that, snap a picture, that would be fantastic. Um, and then of course, if the eggs are being eaten, who's eating them? Um, so that's the daytime observations for smelt eggs. Um, so the night focus, or the nighttime observation is for adult smelt. So again, the big required question is how many smelt do you see? Um, and again, in a little bit, we're gonna go into um, how to estimate um, smelt abundance. So um, again, like in the previous prompt, um, we did not survey at night. So that's somebody who, um, just went out looking for eggs. So we want to be really clear um, which part of the survey you're participating in and at what time. So um, next is stream conditions. So um, this is a little bit more about the survey site that you've chosen. So the water depth not required, um, just an estimate in feet. Um, uh, you know, uh, in whole feet too. Um, you don't have to do one and a half feet, one foot, two foot, three foot, et cetera. Um, the adjacent land um, is an important question. So by adjacent land, we mean from where you're standing at the smelt stream, looking for either eggs or adult smelt, what can you see? So we're not asking um, folks to walk up and down the stream. So it's either wetland, yes or no, forested, developed, agriculture, yes or no for all of those. And that is a required question. Um, so you can have multiple yeses or multiple noes um, for that particular um, data point. So another important one that we're gonna go into in more detail is stream substrate. So substrate is just a really fancy word for what the bottom of the stream looks like. Um, so again, you have a bunch of different options. So we're asking for the primary substrate as the required question. So that's the most important. So what does most of the stream bed look like? Um, and then optional are secondary and tertiary substrate. So that's the second most and the third most abundant um, substrate on the bottom of the stream. So um, again, if that's a question that even after the training you're not quite sure about, just fill in the primary substrate. Um, and again, one thing I will note is that your stream substrate may look different than somebody who, sub, uh, who surveyed the same stream. So don't be alarmed if, if that is the case when you're comparing notes with someone else. Um, so again, tertiary um, stream substrate. Um, another required prompt, uh, overhead canopy cover. That's another thing we're gonna go into in more detail. Um, so we just asked for a range, um, your best estimate. Then another required is obstructions to fish passage. So this question um, clearly is only if you see an obstruction. So from where you're standing, do you see an obstruction? We'll go into um, this in a little bit more detail. Um, and of course, you can always put none observed if you didn't, um, didn't see an obstruction. Um, easy public access to the stream. Um, yes or no questions. So when I'm thinking easy public access to the stream, I'm thinking, um, is this access so easy that I could bring my grandmother um, who's 84 years old down to the stream. Um, so we want to know if it's if it's accessible um, in general. So if you have to go down a steep path, even if there is a path, I wouldn't call that easily accessible. Um, is anyone fishing? So again, this is just going to be for folks who survey for adult smelt at night, um, just a yes or no. Um, and then if you notice that people are fishing, um, we're just wondering how many people you see fishing and you don't need to um, go up and down the stream and ask everybody what they're fishing for. It's simply if somebody is fishing for something. Um, and I suppose if you're, if you're there during the day and you happen to see people fishing, you're welcome to um, circle yes um, for that question as well. So now we're moving to the next page. 
Um, and Danielle is gonna talk about um, these next couple of prompts. All right, so Sarah mentioned that you will need a camera to take a photograph and you'll see that there is a red asterisk next to the photo of the stream bed. So what we would like to do is from what have you do is stand on the stream bank from where you're serving and you're gonna take a photograph looking directly across the stream from one bank to the other. What do you see in the swath in front of you? Um, and Sarah has some illustrations of that that she'll show with photographs in a little bit. You are also able to include other photographs. Um, so if, as Sarah mentioned, you saw a predator eating eggs, that'd be awesome for you to take a photograph of. If you see an obstruction to fish passage, please take a photograph of that as well. Um, if you are maybe feeling a little not, uh, feel, not feeling confident enough with your substrate classifications, you can take a photograph more closely of the substrate and uh, check in with Sarah or I to find out if you're classifying it the way that, if, if what we see in the photograph matches with the way you're classifying it. Um, we do have a field for water temperature. If you happen to have a thermometer and want to take the water temperature, um, you're, you can include that. Um, it's not a required field. And then we also have a section for field notes. If you notice anything unusual or anything that interfered with your observations, please record it here. Um, we do ask that you keep the field notes as brief as possible, but please use that space to convey what you need to to us. And then the very last step is certifying your work. So we want you to go back over your data sheet, check, your, check to make sure that you answered all of the required questions, did you take that required picture? And this is a key thing. Look at your camera. If you've got a digital camera, look at that camera to see if the photo came out. Uh, we've all had instances where we've been in the field, we've taken the photo, your app said, yep, did it, got back to the lab and realized, oh, that didn't come out very well. So you check, check your photograph um, on your phone or on your digital camera while you're in the field. If it looks good, great. If it doesn't look good, go ahead and reshoot that photograph. That's the great thing about digital, right? Um, so once you've done all of the above, you check the box that says you certify that you followed the protocols and checked your work, and then you sign the data sheet. All right. So um, now we're back to the PowerPoint. Danielle's going to talk a little bit about how to find a survey site. And then like I promised, we're going to go into detail about all of the crazy things we just asked you to find. All right, so there are a couple different ways to find a survey site. Uh, what you're looking at right now is that each of those dots represents one of the surveyed spot, smelt spawning streams and they're color coded by whether, what the status of that stream is. Um, so there are kind of, as I said, two ways to find a stream. The first is we'd love you to be explorers. Um, one, as I mentioned before, we're hoping that the survey can help us document undocumented spawning runs. Um, so if you've got a stream in your backyard or a stream in your town that you know about that you wanna go check out, that's a great place to start. Um, if you are less familiar with where the streams are, we're happy to help. Um, we do have mapped locations for, for all of these surveyed streams and we're happy to provide you with a GPS location and a stream name um, if you need a little bit of help finding a stream. And I'm actually going to take a little break right there because we did have a question come in that I think would be useful to answer right now. And the question is about where we want to, where, where we want you to collect the tide. Would you like, would we like it from a tide gauge? Um, let's see. I need to move my screen over so I can read the full question. Especially if there's a salt marsh in between, the head of tide is often hours different from the nearest tide station in terms of the tides. Sarah, what, where would you like people to be collecting their, choosing their tide station location? Um, I think it's important um, for all of the data to be specific to the site that you are located. So that is why we intentionally put low, medium and high. Um, so what my preference would be, and again, I'm happy to talk more about this offline, but my preference would be um, that you 
estimate what the tide is at the time. So um, if you're looking at not much water flow, that's low tide. Um, if you're looking at a lot of water flow, that's high tide. Um, the way I would recommend figuring this out if you're not familiar with the site is um, look up what the tide is in the nearest harbor and then go to the stream um, at what is gonna be high tide um, and then go to the stream at what is gonna be low tide. Um, and so that way you can see the difference of the water levels. Um, so that's absolutely correct that if the tide has to go through a salt marsh, it's gonna be very different um, than the time in the harbor. Um, so I think that this is another thing, um, I'm gonna talk about this a lot in the next half an hour, um, that a lot of this information is so site specific um, and it's gonna be really specific to whatever's going on um, downstream um, from the site that you are located and um, the what the area around you looks like. Um, so this is not a one size fits all. I'm sure all of you have been on the coast of Maine and um, you can see uh, the, the geology of the coast of Maine is so different. Um, and especially a, a, a lot of these small streams, because remember, um, wherever you are surveying, um, there needs to be passage um, from the ocean environment to the, the top point of tide, which is the head of tide. Um, so if you know you are thinking that you've got the, the best stream in the world, um, I would highly suggest looking on Google Maps or um, you know, asking one of us if you're unsure because um, you might have a fantastic stream in your backyard, but it might have a dam in the, in the mouth of it. So um, again, Danielle and I are resources for, for all this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna leave that question there. Um, if Danielle has anything to add, she can jump in. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna move on to some of the um, data. I, I am going to jump in, not on that question, but another one came in that I think would be good to answer since we're still talking about locations. And that was, what if there are a few of us who are surveying the same stream? Is that a problem? And the answer is, no, that's not a problem at all, because you're probably not going to be going there every night, every day. Um, it's a pretty, it's a fairly short spawning season. And so if we've got one volunteer who's going out on Tuesday night and another who goes out on Thursday night, that's going to give us more information about that stream. So um, it's perfectly fine to have more than one person surveying a stream or more than one team, I should say, one of the ones that are partners uh, surveying a stream. The more, the more information we can get, the better. All right, fantastic. So um, again, keep putting questions in the chat box um, and someone will stop me to answer them if I don't see them. Um, okay, so the first data point we're gonna talk about is identifying substrate types. So again, the primary, the most abundant um, thing on the bottom of the stream, um, that's the primary substrate, the secondary is the second most, the tertiary is the third most. So here we've got a really great guide um, for how to tell the difference um, between the different substrate types. I cannot take credit for looking, for making this up. It's absolutely fantastic. So um, when we're talking about boulder, we're talking about bigger than a basketball. When we're talking about cobble, that's gonna be tennis ball to basketball size. Um, so if you imagine, um, you know, a tennis ball in your hand and a basketball, it's in between that. For gravel, um, it's gonna be a peppercorn to a tennis ball. Sand, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with, that's gonna be a grain of salt to a peppercorn. And then silt and clay is gonna be anything that's finer than salt. Um, so silt and clay could include mud, it could include um, you know, anything that looks <laughs> mucky on the bottom of the stream. Um, and then of course, um, the last option is aquatic vegetation. So that could be um, you know, if you're um, in an area 
where there's some, some grass that's growing. And again, the aquatic vegetation, we're just interested if there is vegetation in the stream itself. So not on the sides of the stream, when we're talking about substrate, we're really talking about what is on the bottom of the stream. And I'm, I've got a couple of pictures to illustrate this. Um, and the guide for the boulder cobble gravel sand silt and clay that I just went over the basketball to the salt grain, um, that is going to be on the data sheet with protocols. So um, if you print out the data sheet with protocols, you're gonna have um, that little cheat sheet to look back at. So this is a beautiful picture of a stream. Um, this is a stream where I have surveyed for smelt. Um, and as you can see, uh, this stream bottom would mostly be cobble. So if I was filling out my data sheet, I would say that the primary substrate is cobble. And um, I, you can also see from the angle that I'm taking, that I took the photo, that there's also some silt and clay um, down to the bottom right of, of the photo. So you can see that there, that depending on where you're standing in the stream, if you're all the way, um, in the foreground of, of the photo, you might be seeing silt and clay. If you're all the way in the background, you might be seeing cobble. So um, depending on where you are in the stream, you're going to be seeing different substrates. And again, the primary is the most important. Um, smelt eggs, um, which we'll go into in a little bit, like to stick to rocks. So um, the, or anything really that's on the, um, the substrate, like rocks and boulders and anything, but um, cobble and gravel and boulders, um, the, the eggs stick to the best. So um, that's a great substrate to have um, when you're looking for smelt. And Here's another example. This is also moving us towards the obstructions. Um, but this is another example of what you might see on the substrate. So um, you can see here um, that the primary substrate would be gravel. You can kind of see those little flecks of um, lighter colored stone in there. Um, but the secondary, which is pretty close behind the gravel, would be silt and clay. Um, and this is certainly not a place you should be looking for smelt. I just use this picture to illustrate, um, again, the different types. And um, you can see that there are some larger pieces of rock um, right next to those, those culverts too. And that would, those are actually more um, cobble size. So again, just gives you a range of um, what the substrate looks like. So, um, now we're gonna move on to canopy cover. So canopy cover um, is another important question to answer. So smelt, as I mentioned before, the adult smelt spawn at night. Um, so that means that it can be a little bit challenging to understand um, canopy cover at night. Um, so, um, you can see these two pictures that I have are nice, beautiful pictures during the day. Um, and it, we're asking um, to, for you to choose a range. So zero to 25% um, percent canopy cover would be very, very little canopy cover, almost nothing. Um, whereas 75 to 100% canopy cover would be that you can barely see the sky above you. And again, this, is, um, this will be easier for folks who are going to do egg surveys during the day. Um, it'll be much, much, much easier. But um, what I recommend um, at night is to, again, we're asking for all of the questions you ask, answer, you just answer from the place you are standing next to the stream. So for canopy cover, you're going to look directly above your head. And it's just as far as you can see looking directly above your head. So you don't need to turn your head to the left or to the right and guess the whole canopy cover over the river. It's just the spot where you are standing. Um, so at night, I recommend shining your flashlight or your headlamp up. And um, this is also recommended on the data sheet with protocol. But basically, if you took everything above your head 
and you smushed it into one side um, of your view shed, would it cover 50%, 75%, 100%? Um, And I do understand that this can be a little bit subjective. So if you're going out at night and you're struggling to answer this question, go to the site during the day if you have some time um, because it can be a lot easier. I certainly do that. Um, I believe this is my fourth or fifth year um, participating in this study and leading this study. Um, And I still go to certain sites um, during the day if I'm not positive um, that I saw the canopy cover um, and especially if there's a lot of canopy cover at night it can be hard to tell um, you know is it 70 percent canopy cover which would put you in the 51 to 75 or is it 90 percent canopy cover which would put you in the 76 to 100 percent range um, and again you're going to be um, using your best estimate so we're not asking for exact answers So it looks like we've got a couple of questions coming in. So I'm just going to pause for a minute and read the questions and then I will answer them. Okay, great. So um, we're going to get back to that um, that question. One of the questions when we talk about um, how to estimate smelt. So I did see um, somebody's question. So we'll get to you in just a second. So um, this picture and this picture um, I'm using to illustrate when you're standing at the stream what canopy cover might look like when you're looking around you again for the sake of this presentation both of the photos are during the day so this first photo um, this is actually a fantastic smelt stream in down east Maine which is where um, I live and work and survey Um, and so this stream you can see has zero to 25 percent canopy cover you can see the light shining down right on the stream um you know the entire stream is illuminated again when you're actually looking for canopy cover you're not going to be looking down the stream like this but i just wanted to illustrate what it might look like if you're standing along the stream and there's zero percent canopy cover so you can see that there are trees on either side um but the stream itself is not covered by um any kind of canopy So this is another picture, Um, again, uh, depending on when you're gonna be looking for smelt, whether it's in March or May, um, you're probably not gonna get this many leaves, but this just illustrates um, what it might look like if you have 75 to 100% canopy cover. So you can see that the stream itself is pretty dark. Um, There is light kind of poking through, um, but the trees grow over the stream um, completely. So this would be 75 to 100 percent. Just excuse me one. Keep your questions coming to folks. We've had great questions come in and we're saving a bunch of them for the end too. So know that if you've put in a question, we haven't missed it. We're just going to get to it at the end. So now um, another important um, data point for smelt themselves, but also for the restoration projects like Danielle mentioned is obstructions to fish passage. So we have a couple of different options and I'm gonna go through each option. So the first option is the culvert. So that picture that I showed before of the two culverts that run under the road, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen culverts before, but again, um, can you see a culvert when you look up or down the stream? So from where you're standing, so you don't need to walk anywhere, it's just in your view shed, can you see a culvert? Another option is a low dam. Um, It could be any kind of a man-made dam, but a low dam. Um, A roadbed, so the picture that I have on the left with the truck would be an example of a roadbed going through a stream. So you can see that the stream is trying to um, still continue past the road, but that's an example of what a roadbed might look like. So depending on where you live, um, 
you might encounter that. I certainly have. Um, a beaver dam is another one I'm sure many of you have seen before. Um, the picture on the right shows a nice big beaver dam. Um, so that's another um, obstruction to fish passage. A natural falls is another great one. So a natural waterfall um, that looks to you like fish can't get up it is a great one to um, to add. Um, again, the natural falls is going to be different from an incline. So you might have a stream that's flowing um, a little bit steeply, um, but that's going to be different from from the natural falls because um, fish might be able to get up that. But again, if that's not something you're sure about, um, you, that's a great way to take a picture and contact Danielle or myself um, and add that into your notes in your observation that you saw this one part of the river that looked really steep and you weren't sure if it was a natural falls or not. Um, so you wanted clarification. That's a great follow up to collecting your data. And this is another example of what culverts can look like. Um, you can see that these culverts look to be um, passable by fish. So we're not asking you to make the decision of whether or not the culverts are passable by fish, just if they exist. And that goes for any of these other categories. You might see fish swimming through just fine, but we wanna be aware um, where there are impediments. And again, this is the picture that I showed before to refresh your memory. You can see there are three culverts in this photo. Um, and again, these culverts are not doing as well, um, but just another, another example. So you can see the different things you might encounter. This is a great example of a dam. So I'm sure um, many of you have, have seen a, a dam before, but if if you see one, even if fish are able to get by, even if there's a fishway attached to the dam, um, it's important to make sure that you note that. And then finally, um, this would also be um, an example of an obstruction. Um, so this would be an obstruction um, that's a little bit different. So um, I'm just gonna go back to the prompts really quickly. So if you saw a lot of materials in the river, um, I would note that as a either a beaver dam or a natural fall. So um, the picture that I just showed is not a beaver dam, but I would click one of those. And then in your notes, I would note that you saw a lot of sticks, debris, logs in the river that looked like an obstruction. Um, so that's, again, another way to use the notes. And as Danielle mentioned, try to be as brief as possible. You certainly don't need to write in, in complete sentences. Um, but this is another example of an obstruction. And I wanted to show this picture to, um, again, emphasize that we don't want to change the natural environment that we're in at all. So you can see that these are some trees um, that have fallen in into the river. They may be stopping fish from passing, but certainly um, none of our volunteers participants should move anything in the river, even if it's blocking fish passage. This is again, a great opportunity to take a picture and contact one of us um, so that, you know, if something does need to be done, um, we can do it. We don't want um, volunteers, participants in the survey to be making those kinds of judgment calls. So even if you think you might be able to move the stick or the tree or whatever it is out of the water, we just ask that you, you leave it as is. Um, it's, you know, for your safety and because we don't want to be um, changing the river, changing the ecosystem. We want to leave things as, as we, we saw them. Um, and also, you know, you're not supposed to be in the stream either. So, um, you know, that kind of adds to that. We so. did have, we did have a question come in. Um, and that was, why is it important to know the canopy cover, the rock size, um, et cetera? It's obviously, I think, a really kind of obvious why we want to know about obstructions that prevents fish from accessing further upstream habitat. Um, but we also want to know what the habitat looks like. Um, 
And one of the key, one of the key questions we're really interested in is why are there smeltons in one stream and not in the next stream over? Smelts are really interesting in that they, they don't always go to the same stream, unlike salmon. Um, so we want to know why, why are they using one stream off of a, a particular embayment, but not the next one over. And so understanding what all the different, vi vi excuse me, biological variables are is really important for helping us answer that question. So the things like the canopy cover, what does the substrate look like? Um, is the substrate good for, even good for smelts in that stream? Um, or is it too fine? Um, Another thing, another reason we'd like to know this is if, if we want to go ahead and do a stream, a, a, a um, population and restoration activity, we want to know that the habitat is good for smelt before we try getting them in there. Awesome. Um, so now we're going to talk about what everybody has been waiting for. We're talking about smelt. So, um, we're, you're either going to be looking for eggs or adult smelt. And again, eggs you're only looking for during the day and adult smelt you're only looking for at night. So um, these are two photos of what eggs and adult smelt might look like. Um, I'm just going to quickly describe what you're going to see when you're looking for eggs and quickly describe what you're going to look for when you're looking for adult smelt. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail. So you can see um, the picture I have up about what of smelt eggs. Um, the smelt eggs are teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, and when the smelt spawn, the eggs stick to anything like glue, like cement. Um, so if there's rocks or gravel, um, the picture that Danielle showed at the beginning of the talk, we're going to come back to um, where there's a really thick egg bed. So um, the picture that we're looking at of smelt eggs right now, you can see there's not too many smelt eggs, um, but you can definitely see them. The ones that are white are dead and the ones that are more of a clear color are still alive. Um, so when you're looking for smelt eggs, you're gonna be looking um, at the rocks, at things in the stream. Um, if you're looking for smelt eggs, um, we definitely recommend looking at a low or lower tide um, because a lot of the um, rocks will be exposed. Um, so especially if you're in saltier water, um, I will note that um, Smelt eggs cannot be in purely salt water. It has to be brackish water, which means, um, or fresh water. Um, and brackish just means a mix of salt and fresh water. Um, so if you're near the ocean or standing next to a big bay, um, you may not find smelt eggs, but you may find adult smelt at night. So um, the eggs can't survive if there's too much salinity or salt in the water. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind as you're um, looking at potential, potential places to go. Um, and then I'll switch gears a little bit for the adult smelt. So for the adult smelt, we're asking everybody to look for the adult fish. Um, at this time of the year, um, from you know March really until June in some places, um, you're just gonna be looking for these adult fish. Um, they're not going to have any babies with them or anything like that. Obviously, that's why they're coming up to spawn to um, broadcast their eggs. Um, so they're going to be potentially, depending on where you are, they could be swimming in a school like in this picture where you can see there's a bunch of them. Um, or there could be just a few swimming through. So um, when you're looking for adult smelt, um, especially, I highly suggest that um, you get to wherever you want to survey and you stand there um, for a few minutes and, and wait. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to look for adult smelt at night um, properly in um, just a couple slides. So first I wanted to talk about the egg. So you can see the top picture. Um, that's a rock with some dead smelt eggs on the top. Those white dots are the dead smelt eggs. Um, and you can see the picture in the bottom um, is a picture of what smelt eggs look like under the water. So you can see that 
Um, some of those are white, but then you can also see all of these little bumps that are more of a yellowish color, um, more of a clear yellowish color. Um, and those would be live smelt eggs. So when we're asking um, everybody to estimate though this is not a required question, if you're estimating the width and the length of the egg bed, we're talking about the entire egg bed. So that includes dead eggs, where it's not just the eggs that are live. So the egg bed is the expanse that you see the eggs. So if you are standing in a location and um, you know the stream is three feet across, that would be your width would be three feet. Um, and then your length would be down the stream. So the, um, you know, how the stream is flowing. So the width is across and the length is um, up and down the stream from where you're standing. Um, so again, like with the adult smelt, the egg beds could be anywhere from um, three feet by two feet to, um, <laughs> there's one, again, we'll look at the picture in just a minute. Um, there's one egg bed I've seen that was, I believe it was four feet by almost 80 feet um, because there were so many smelt spawning. So this is gonna potentially look different in different places. So um, certainly if you're just seeing a few smelt eggs, um, that probably means that are, there are not as many smelt there. And if you're seeing a ton of smelt eggs, it means that there's a lot of smelt there. So either option is possible, especially as we go up and down the coast, it, it, it really varies. Hey, Sarah, do you mind um, going back to that photo? We had a question. Are you able to use your cursor and point to the dead versus live eggs on that photo just so that it's really clear? Are you all seeing my cursor? I have been using my cursor. Yes. Oh, it's dark. Yeah. It's hard to see, but maybe now folks can see it a little bit better. So I'm going to have, um, actually, um, if you let me keep going, I have a better picture of dead smelt eggs. Um, that's just coming up. So here we can go. This is dead smelt eggs. Um, so you can see um, this obviously is a location where um, at low tide, all of these eggs are exposed. So every single one of the eggs in this photo is dead. Um, they look like little, they're bigger than salt grains and smaller than peppercorns, um, but they're these little white dots. And when they're dead, they are bright white. Um, and you can see even on the um, pieces of granite that are in this photo, so the lighter colored rocks, it's still really clear. They're very white. Um, and you can see what I mean by that the eggs stick to absolutely everything on the bottom of the stream. Um, so this is a fantastic example of what dead smelt eggs look like. And again, you may or may not see this many eggs. Um, and then I'm just going to jump back another slide. So this is a really important photo because this is a fantastic example of what an egg bed looks like when you have a lot of eggs. So you can see that um, the egg bed looks very yellow. Um, and even though it looks, um, it makes the rocks underneath it look lighter in color, all of those eggs are alive. Um, so when the eggs are piled up, they might be lighter in color because they're piled up on top of each other. But if you zoomed in really, really close and looked really close without, of course, disturbing anything, you can see that um, the, these eggs, individual eggs, even though they're layered on top of each other, um, these individual eggs um, are in fact alive. So um, this is kind of both sides of, of, of what you can see. The first picture I showed, so this picture is not that many smelt eggs. Um, so this would be a lower number of smelt eggs. And this is an incredible number <laughs> of smelt eggs. So the general rule is and the general estimate for smelt eggs, and again, this will be on the data sheet with protocols, um, is that a one by one square, so a one foot square of smelt eggs touching. So if you lined them all perfectly up and they were perfectly touching in a one foot square, um, that would be approximately 67, 60 to 70,000 eggs. 
So that's a lot of eggs and that's one layer all perfectly touching. I can tell you that unless you see an egg bed like the one I'm showing you, they're not all gonna be perfectly touching. They'll probably be spread out. But um, when we have an egg bed like this, where you can see there's layer upon layer, um, I don't have an exact number to, to give you all, but I would say if this looks like, this looks to me, um, like it's probably three to five layers deep. So that's 60,000 times three, 70,000 times three. So you can see that um, that's a lot of smell digs. And again, the, um, the data sheet that you're gonna be filling out is tens, hundreds, thousands, millions, 10 millions. So that's a really wide range. So we're not asking you to go down and count every egg. It's just an estimate. Um, and again, if this is something that you're not um, confident on, we can, Danielle and I can certainly help, you know, in an ideal world, we'd all be able to go down to a stream together um, and I'd be able to show you all this. So um, like we can just see from pictures now, but um, a, a good way to find smelt eggs, if you're not sure, um, like I mentioned before, is to go at low tide. Um, to the stream and um, to go um, where is obviously safe, um, but to go where you can see smelt eggs on the rocks that are dead, because if there's not that many smelt eggs, the dead eggs are much easier to spot than the live eggs because they're that bright white color. Um, so that can be, be a great option. Um, and the other thing I want to say, um, especially as we're going into adult smelt, is the smelt run. So the run is the duration of time in which the smelt are swimming upstream to spawn. Um, so the run, depending on where you are, could be one night or it can be three weeks to a month and a half in some places. So this is really going to be location specific. I know um, certainly in Down East Maine, we have a lot of smelt. Um, we have a lot of potential for restoration. This um, site actually um, that Danielle mentioned, um, this is Smelt Brook in Perry. This is a site that Down East Salmon Federation took out um, an impoundment. And this picture is actually from the first year after um, the old bridge that had collapsed into the river was taken out. So this is, this is year one um, of a restoration site. So, um, you know, place, things change over time, but um, it's really important to make sure that we're, you know, we're keeping this data up to date. So um, even if you're surveying a site that we may be surveyed um, a past year or previous year, and you're seeing something totally different this year, um, that might not be cause for alarm. It's definitely um, good to note that, but um, I'm just gonna pause for a second and see if there's any other questions and then we'll, then we'll keep going. Yeah, Sarah, you mentioned the spawning season. Um, sorry, you mentioned the spawning at a location can be specific, but can you give us a general sense of the spawning season duration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Danielle mentioned that at the top of the presentation. Um, so depending on where you are in Maine, you can think of Maine, um, the beginning is gonna, earlier spawning is gonna happen down south. It's not a hard and fast rule, but generally, it's going to happen in southern Maine and then move up along the coast. So um, generally speaking, spawning is going to happen from March until June. So um, in March, I certainly won't be seeing smelt in Down East Maine, um, but maybe folks in York County will be seeing smelt in March. Um, for um, folks in Down East Maine, um, I say June because our runs usually end in June. They don't begin in June, but they end um, at the end of June. Um, there are certainly some places that um, I've seen smelt eggs around the, the 4th of July weekend, um, but those places are, are far and few between. Um, so it's generally speaking in that range. I would say on average, um, a smelt run will a good smelt run where we know that smelt exists. Again, Danielle mentioned that, um, you know, places have been surveyed before. So when we know that there are smelt there, I would say it averages about two weeks maybe. 
um, for the smelt run, but there are so many locations we have not surveyed and we're not going to be sure if it's going to be one day or a couple weeks. So um, I definitely recommend if it's a location that's new that you go multiple times, um, especially if it's somewhere that's that's never been been surveyed before. So I know that's not super specific, um, but I just want to make sure that, um, you know, I'm not telling everyone a hard and fast rule because, you know, the, the down east coast is going to be so different from mid coast is going to be so different from from the southern coast. So um, I know it's a little bit vague, but if you have um, follow up questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer them. And um, I certainly um, have only been surveying in down east Maine. Um, so that's Hancock and Washington County for the past four years. So um, Danielle is going to be more of the expert um, on uh, more mid coast southern um, regions. Um, and we did, you know, do a small survey um, last year to kind of kick this off. So we have some sites that are um, not down east. Um, and there's certainly the DMR surveys from from before that surveyed um, in more southern regions. So um, Hopefully that sort of answers the question. I'm gonna add a little bit there. Um, we, we do send out periodic emails to those of you who sign up to, to survey. Um, and we also have a discussion board in the GMRI portal that Riley will talk about in a little bit where um, announcements get posted, where questions get, can get answered. And so we, we do, we will be keeping a, keeping a pulse on things. And when smelt starts showing up, we'll make note of that and let you all know so that we can kind of live live time, let you guys know as the, the smelt make their way up the coast. Awesome. Um, so now we're gonna talk about adult smelt. So again, this is the survey that's gonna happen at night. So um, this, is a great picture of smelt at night. The first thing I'm gonna say is that even though we've said that you have to have a flashlight, a headlight, something to get you down in the stream, um, if you shine your light at smelt, they're gonna swim away from it. And um, also um, to add on to what I mentioned before about not stepping in the stream, it being illegal while people are um, smelt fishing, it's also not allowed to shine your light on smelt as you're as you're catching them. So this survey doesn't include um, any fishing, but I just wanted to, to note that. So um, I'll just give you all a little scenario of, of how I would um, survey if I went down to this stream. So the first thing you wanna do um, is just walk down to the stream, um, make sure you're in a good spot, shine your light a little bit um, in the stream to, to see kind of what's going on and then shut your flashlight off. Um, and you wanna stand there for a minute or two with your flashlight off, being still, being quiet, um, to allow the stream, the smelt, um, if they're there, to kind of go back to their natural, their natural rhythm. Um, and that way, you know, if you're coming down the path and you've kicked some stones and they go into the river um, and they scare away all the smelt, you're, it's not um, gonna change your data. So it's, it's great to get down to the stream, be very quiet, um, shut your flashlight off and kind of let things go back to their natural rhythm because we want to be surveying without human interaction with the fish. Um, and certainly if you go to the stream and you notice that there is some sort of fishing activity, um, we just ask that you go away from anybody that is fishing. So if the the fish are swimming upstream, which they'll all be swimming upstream. Um, we ask that you go downstream of the people fishing or upstream of the people fishing, depending on where it's safe for you to be. Ideally, um, you would be upstream of the people fishing. So you'd be um, closer to the head of tide, closer to the river, further away from the ocean, um, because obviously the people are fishing are taking fish out of the river. So those fish are not gonna be able to spawn. 
So um, if you can safely be above people who are fishing, um, that's the best recommended practice. So um, after you've shut your light off, um, you can turn your flashlight back on and um, without spotlighting one spot, kind of scan over right in front of you. So again, you're surveying in your view shed right in front of you in the stream. Um, and similar to the eggs, we're asking for if there are tens, hundreds, thousands of smelts. So this is an overall estimate. So um, generally speaking, what I like to do is um, look and see how many smelt I see. Um, and what I'll do is kind of shine my light across the stream. Um, so I'm not directly spotlighting in the stream and um, I'll just count how many smelt swim by me in about 30 seconds. So if I'm in a stream and there are, I can't even count how many smelts are swimming by me um, because they're swimming by so fast and there's so many of them and you can't really even see the bottom of the stream. Um, depending on how wide the stream, that'd probably be thousands of smelt. Um, if you have your light pointed at the stream and you only see two smelt swim by um, while, you're, while you're there, while you're counting, that would be tens of smelt. Um, and again, um, this may be um, obvious to some of you, but um, the smelt need water to swim upstream in. So um, the best time to look for smelt is the high tide at night in the evening. Um, so the reason that they need high tide in, is because some locations, some locations that I've surveyed, the smelt can only get up at high tide. Um, so you might think, oh, there's no smelt here. There's just a little trickle of water. When in fact, at high tide, there potentially could be smelt that are getting up the stream. They just need more water to get over some rocks um, or some natural components of the stream. So that's the best time um, is the high tide in the evening. So you want it to be, to be dark. Um, and you know, depending on your location, obviously, this can vary. Um, and I'm just going to look for questions for one minute. Sarah, we have a couple of questions coming in about um, getting more specific about what type of light people should be using um, and about spotlighting. So if you want to review those. Yeah, sure. So um, I personally use a regular old flashlight or a headlamp, just plain old white light. Um, usually um, with my headlamp is what I use most and I'll use the dimmest light setting. Um, obviously don't use the dimmest light setting to get down to the river, but once you're looking for smelt, I usually use the dimmest light setting. Um, if, my, if the water I'm looking to, into is deeper, I might increase the light, but you certainly don't need any special kind of light um, to look for smelt. On a clear night, with a full moon, sometimes I don't even use a light um, because you can see the smelt pretty well if there's um, not very much canopy cover, but you don't need anything fancy. And by spotlighting smelt, what I mean is that you're taking the beam of your flashlight and you're just pointing it directly down into the stream. And when you do that, the smelt will swim away from that light. So when I say point your flashlight kind of across the stream, I mean, you're, you're almost pointing it um, to the bank across the stream from you. So you're still getting light on the stream, but you're not pointing the brightest setting of your uh, mag light right in the middle of the stream because that will affect um, the smelt's behavior. So um, any kind of flashlight, even the flashlight on your phone is fine. Um, and we'll talk about photos in, in a little bit so I can um, kind of reiterate that. But you don't need anything special, anything fancy. Um, if you are a fisherman um, and you have a way to look for smelt that you like, please share that with us. Um, and feel free to, to use whatever method uh, you've used in the past, especially if you've been smelt fishing before. Um, so 
hopefully that that clarified a little bit about the best use with a flashlight or, or a headlamp. I, my preference is a headlamp. One other question that came in, Sarah, is, is there a minimum size stream we should be checking? I wish I had a hard and fast answer for that. I would say no. Um, I have found smelt last year um, in a stream in Lubeck. I found smelt in barely a trickle of water. I should say smelt eggs. I was looking during the day, um, but there was barely a trickle of water and it was right up against a huge natural falls. Um, so smelt can get upstream if there's not a lot of water. I would say it's not worth looking if the stream is less than a foot wide. Um, I think in that case, it's probably not a great stream to look at. Um, but smelts are found in all sorts of places and certainly at Downey Salmon Federation. I know we've had a couple of restoration projects, um, a couple different smelt streams in Downey, Maine. Um, we've seen that smelt have come back pretty quickly. So um, for instance, in um, Smeltbrook and Sullivan, um, that stream, is uh, pretty narrow. There was a granite dam that was across the stream. So once the granite dam was taken out, the stream literally had to find its path because it, had it hadn't been past the granite dam in a really long time. And so that was kind of just a little channel in the mud during high tide, the water was pretty high. Um, but that is that was a brand new stream. And the first year after the granite dam was taken out, a couple of smelt were spotted um, actually by one of my colleagues who's also a biologist. So that's just an example of, um, you know, some of the cool things you might see um, if you're able to find smelt. But um, certainly I think it's actually more important to be aware of if there's um, a hanging culvert, a dam, some kind of obstruction that's downstream of where you're trying to survey. So um, by downstream, I mean closer to the ocean, um, because if there is something that the smelt can't get up over, um, again, you could have the perfect smelt location, the perfect cobble and gravel mix um, with the perfect canopy cover. And if they can't get up past that um, impoundment, um, you're not going to find smelt. Um, and there's actually a great resource um, online of uh, all of the impoundments um, and impediments in Maine. So that's certainly something you can look up. And I think that might be on our website as well. Um, but again, that's we're going to be sending you all more resources. So um, if you have questions about if there's an impoundment on the stream you want to be looking at, um, uh, you know, we'll send more information about that. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back to looking for adult smelt. Um, so um, this picture um, I would classify as hundreds of smelt. Um, this is another photo. Um, you can see there are so many smelt in this picture that are getting up these little falls. Um, you can see one fish kind of flipped on its side. That's that glare in the middle of the picture. Um, so this is another example of a really small stream. Um, this is stream is not very wide and it supports a very healthy population of smelt. So um, don't think you need to go into really big wide rivers and streams. Um, so, um, you know, something small like this, you can see there's some boulder, there's some um, cobble substrate. Um, this is a great, a great smelt stream. And this stream, I would also say there are hundreds of smelt. Um, these are both locations I've been. So um, obviously from one picture, you wouldn't be able to tell that, but um, this would be another example of what a hundred smelt might look like. And you can see they're really stacked up in next to each other um, going up over those rocks. So um, I'm gonna pause one more time and see if we have any more questions. Okay. 
Um, one question that I see is that, um, can you survey for eggs and adult smelt in the same day? You absolutely can. Um, you can look for eggs during the daytime at low tide, and then you can look for adult smelt at the nighttime high tide in the same exact location. That is perfectly fine. Um, it would be great to, if you were able to go to the same place more than once. So um, if you're somebody who only has time to survey for adult smelt um, and you happen to see smelt or not see smelt, um, it's great to go back um, two or three times um, because as I mentioned before, some of these smelt runs are gonna be one week, maybe one day. Um, so if you're able to go back more than once, that's fantastic. And certainly if you're able to go during at night and then during the day, that's even better because maybe you've not been there at the exact right time to see um, adult smelt swim upstream, but their eggs are going to be around for a bit longer. So maybe you're able to see um, the eggs of the smelt as well. So again, I, I know uh, everybody's pressed for time, but the more times you can go, certainly the better. Um, and there's no sort of ideal, um, you know, you have to go every two days or anything like that, but um, certainly going to the same place multiple times is fantastic. And even if there's multiple people going to mul the same place multiple times, that's just more eyes um, on the stream looking for smelt. And this, you know, as Danielle and I have both said, this survey is sort of exploratory in that we know there are smelt certain places that have been surveyed over the years, but there are plenty of other places that haven't been surveyed where there could be smelt. And um, so going multiple times can, can certainly help with that. So um, now I'm gonna go into the photos. So the, what, the photo, we have one photo that is required and that's the photo of the stream bed. So by that, we just mean, what were you looking at when you were looking for smelt eggs or adult smelt? So it doesn't matter nighttime, daytime. Um, it's just what you were looking at. So if there's ever a question of where you were, or um, if you see, you know, a lot of smelt in a location that we've never seen smelt before, the photo can be the the proof, the evidence, the indisputable evidence um, that there were smelt eggs. Um, or adult smelt. So just the photo of what you're looking at in the stream. Um, so if you're taking um, a photo with your phone um, and you've got your phone in this orientation, in the landscape orientation, you want to line your photo up um, where the bottom of your photo is kind of the um, stream, the edge of the stream that's in front of your feet. And then you want to line the top of the photo with the edge of the stream that's on the other bank or the other side. And again, the stream size may vary, so you may need to adjust that. You can certainly take a landscape photo as well. I would recommend um, the kind of the same parameters where you're lining up the edges of the photo with the edge of the stream. Um, and again, if you're in a really, really tiny, skinny stream, um, you know, you won't be able to do that, but that's generally speaking what we're looking for. We want to know what were you looking at? So there's three additional photos that you can take. Um, I highly recommend you take multiple photos. Um, you could take photos of an obstruction. So if you see, um, a culvert, take a picture of the culvert um, and add that if you, uh, like I said before, if you see predators eating smelt or eating smelt eggs, take a picture of that. That's fantastic. That's very exciting. Um, and certainly take pictures of, of the fish themselves too. And if you see something interesting that we haven't covered, if you see um, something interesting that's happening with um, the area that you've been in, um, certainly take a picture of that and put a little note in your note section um, about that. And now I'm gonna show you some of my photos that I've taken and we're gonna look at some bad photos that I've taken. As Danielle said, sometimes you go down and you're like, wow, I just took a fantastic photo. This is the best photo ever. And then you get home and you're like, wow, that was a terrible photo. I wish I took four more photos. So I had some to choose from. So 
this first picture is an example of a terrible photo. So this is a photo of a smelt stream at night. You can see that there are other people who are in the area. This was taken several years ago. Um, you can see that you can't really tell what anybody's looking at. If I didn't tell you that those were people um, at the stream with their headlamps on, you probably wouldn't know what this was a picture of. So this is an example of a terrible photo. Um, if you're taking photos at night, you um, need to have your flash on. So this is a, an example of a photo without any flash. Um, you can also see that I took a photo looking down the stream. Um, so that's not what we want for the required photo. This could be an additional photo, but you definitely want it, whatever photos you, um, you share, um, that there it's clear what the photo is of because, um, you know, these photos are coming to us and we don't necessarily know what you saw. Um, so it's, it's great to, to have a photo that's really clear. This is another example of a photo that's not great. So you can see I took a photo of a culvert um, and I am standing sort of on top of the culvert. You can see the bank was really steep, so I didn't go down there. Um, and the reason that this is an example of a photo that's not as good um, is because only part of the photo is lit. So you can kind of see what I was looking at, um, but you can only see part of the photo. So if you're in an area, you can see the stream is a little bit wider. Um, you should be using your flashlight um, to take a better picture of the stream. So again, this is a picture, this is a great picture of the smelt stream. This is fantastic. If you find this, you win the lottery. Again, another fantastic photo of a smelt stream. If you find this, you win. And I'm gonna wrap up right there because we've, we're out of time. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> so I, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanna make sure that um, we get a chance to go over the platform a little bit. And so feel, you know, if you need to drop out because it's coming up on 5.30, please feel free and reach out to us with questions. Um, but I just wanna quickly introduce you to the platform and talk about a couple of changes if you were part of the Frostfish project and then walk you through what should be a simple kind of orientation to where you can find things on the platform. Uh, this thing's always in the way. Okay, so investigate.gmri.org is our platform. And I'm gonna quickly show you those changes and then I'm gonna spend a little time on the project. Um, if you've been with us before and you did the Frostfish back in December, we did a, an overhaul to our registration system, which is a lot smoother and um, easier for everyone, but it requires that you change your password. So if you click on um, login as though you were going back for the first time, you, you'll see this message and you just simply need to click reset your password, put your email in that you used for your account and everything, it'll follow up with you and tell you what you need to do. If you're new, um, if you click register, you're going to see this screen and we just ask you to follow the instructions, username, email, password, and, and you're ready to go. So once you've kind of got your account set up, then you're in business to go um, join us on the platform. And so I, I am just gonna simply walk through a couple of things and show you um, how to find what you're looking for. So I've, I've clicked login here. Um, it takes you back to the, the main page, all of the projects on the platform. And I encourage you to spend a little time checking it out. We've got a lot of things going on, including the smell project. There's some pretty interesting citizen science work happening. You're going to be looking for this guy, smelt spawning. And what you're going to find here is kind of a, a thumbnail of information about the project and a really rich amount of content, probably equivalent to what you just learned in the last hour and a half, but it's all here in print if you want to go back and kind of solidify what you learned. There's lots of good stuff in here that these guys have worked pretty hard to put together. Um, this tab here, prep and collect, is really going to solidify all the protocols. Um, you'll be able to find your data sheets here um, to click and print out. And then the most important thing is this uh, contribute tab, which is where we're going to ask you to add the data. So if you click contribute, you're going to see this screen. And the first thing we're going to need to know is where you went and when you did it. So um, 
You have two ways of doing this. You can either enter the coordinate data directly from your device, or you can click this marker. Icon. You can sort of zoom in to where you went, um, click the marker icon. Hold on, let me get back to the to a coastal stream here. Um, click the marker icon. It'll populate the coordinates. So again, you can do that either way. Make sure your date is right and then add some data. And I won't spend a lot of time here. I just want to tell you that the what Danielle and Sarah went through on the data sheet, it's laid out exactly the same in the system. And so you're just going to go through and enter the information that matches what you wrote on your data sheet. And I think the best practices for this are to make sure you filled everything out on the paper data sheet and that when you get to the platform, you're ready to enter it so you don't you don't wait, you lose time or you know spend a lot of time trying to enter it and possibly have any kind of network um, glitches. So getting in there and entering it all in one shot is is good. Um, the site, the fields that are required, if you submit your data sheet without entering them, um, it's not going to let you. It's going to basically give you some feedback as to what you missed. So if you're having trouble submitting, just scroll back up and see if you missed a couple of fields. There's a lot of information being collected. It's all really important. It's not difficult. You just may have, have overlooked a field. So fortunately, the tool will give you a little hint on that. Um, and that should be everything you need. I did want to clarify when Sarah was answering the question about um, uh, doing your observations for eggs or smelt or both that each time you go out, you're going to want a new data sheet because each time it's a new observation. So if you went out in the morning, you'd fill out a data sheet, mark the time and location. And if you went back out that same day, you just obviously it's a different time and a different section of the data sheet that you're entering. So hopefully that wasn't too quick. We just don't want to take too much of your time since we've already asked for so much. But if you have any problems with data, um, this email address at the bottom of the site will get directed to our team that works on the platform and we can we can try to help you as quickly as we can. I think that's I'll stop there. Thanks, Riley. And um, thank you everyone so much, as Riley said, for your time this evening. Um, I'll leave any final words to Danielle and Sarah, but we're super grateful that you're excited and hopefully um, continue in the process and sign up to do the SMELT surveys. And we have um, your email contact information because you registered for this training. And so we will be in touch with any additional information that you'll need to actually get out and survey. So Sarah, Danielle, any final words? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody so much for sitting through all of this information. I know it's a lot. I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but, um, you know, Danielle and I will be in touch. You will all have our emails, and I really highly suggest you reach out to us. Um, and if you know anybody who knows something about smell, reach out to them too. Um, a lot of a lot of folks have a lot of knowledge, especially some fishermen. I noticed a question about that. So um, just thank you all for sitting through all of this. And um, I really hope everybody gets to see some smelt this spring. Let's add uh, my own thanks. And um, as Molly mentioned, please watch for an email from us in the coming days that will include a recording of this, a link to a recording of this training. Um, as well as a, a post-training survey that we'd like you to fill out to help us keep track of who's volunteering and where they plan to survey. And we did have a lot of other questions come in and we will answer those through the uh, discourse page on the Gulf of Maine, on the, the salmon spawning site that Riley showed you. Hi, this is Sherry, I have a question. Oh, hello, Sherry. Yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering, uh, my, my niece is a um, wildlife biologist graduate, and she may be interested in joining this survey, and I'm, I'm not sure she um, had a chance to sign up. So can I share this with her? Absolutely. And if you want to forward her the email that you get from um, Danielle following the presentation, that would be awesome. We so would she, really appreciate that. So she can sign up post-training? Yes. Person? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. Have a really great evening. We will be in touch.